Uh, Rowan's uh, story about Alexander Graham uh, Bell reminded me of an anecdote in, I think it's in, um, what's that wonderful tone, um, by Bill Bryson. Short history and everything. Sure, sure. Where when Alexander Graham Bell launched his telephone, he said to the audience, every city in the world will one day have a telephone. <laughs> Much to people's astonishment and disbelief. So, uh, clever. Um, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's 1980, uh, Carter's in the White House, and uh, US spending has just hit 10% of GDP. And everyone in Washington is panicking about this unsustainable healthcare spending, how it's going to bankrupt the, uh, the, the country. Well, of course, it didn't. And today, the US spent about $3 trillion. You know, that's what more than about three times the size of our economy. Well, it's probably more than $3 trillion now. And you know it hasn't bankrupted uh, uh, the uh, the country, and healthcare spending right across the entire OECD, if you believe McKinsey's, has been increasing by about GDP plus two percent very consistently. It's quite quite remarkable. And of course, we're seeing even uh, greater acceleration in spending in the developing uh, uh, world. So, you know, I get I get slightly bemused about this uh, the rhetoric you hear from time to time about healthcare spending is unsustainable. Of course, it's not. You know, we might end up spending 98% of the economy on healthcare if that's what we choose as a civilised or civilised or uncivilised society to spend our healthcare. The real, real questions for us policy makers, makers and uh, economists, not that I'm an economist, but I like to think I am, is what, A, what level of, what are we prepared to trade off and sacrifice to accommodate that spending? You know, which is really an issue around allocative efficiency. How can we ensure that alloc capital is allocated in a way that actually reflects the invisible hand society's uh, approximation of their, of their overall welfare? And so what are we prepared to trade off? And what, what level of uh, inefficiency are we prepared to tolerate uh, in this system? Which is really a, a discussion around uh, technical efficiency. You know what it is actually costing us to uh, uh, produce widgets rather than you know, what is a reasonable level of um, uh, demand. So you know, there are two issues. I'll come back to those issues um, uh, in, the first in, in a moment. But the other thing I want to mention, just a thought, it's actually a very happy problem. For anyone who's in the business of healthcare like I am, and I assume um, you know, many of you here today are involved in healthcare, maybe vicariously, you might be lend money to people uh, in, in healthcare, so it's you know it's a, it's a, it's a rising sea. We we mostly well I at least sail on that sea as, as Rowan does. It's also making the world a better place. You know it's meaning you know people in uh, you know, are living longer, uh, healthier lives, uh, particularly people in um, uh, developing uh, uh, nations, and it's good for the economy if it's productive um, uh, spending and, um, and and production. So you know we. There's a lot of hand wring goes on about oh, healthcare, isn't it terrible? And you know it's going to blow up the, the economy one day. Well, it's not. No, not if we're sensible and, and, and we're, we're smart about it. I've been thinking. I've been in the job about 12 years now, and um, you know I've been scratching my head all that time, thinking, you know, what, what is actually wrong here? Okay, there's too much government re reliance on government uh, in the system. You know, that always rings alarm bells for me in terms of. Uh, the innovation, there's so many barriers to entry, particularly in our, our private healthcare system, the barriers to entry are you know, awful. You know, we have this thing called risk equalisation, uh, we have, um, we have uh, the fact that um, you know, government regulation scares off a lot of uh, would-be uh, competitors, things like pricing and control, but I've been thinking about why is this market for healthcare by and large different to the market for cars or coffee tables? Uh, or, or TVs. Well, well, you know, what is it about uh, healthcare? And when you think about it, there, there are two fundamental issues uh, at, at work here. If you think about market failure, 101 economics, uh, the first is, is inf our information symmetries, which Rowan briefly touched upon. I'll talk more about that in a moment. You know, how, how do you actually cure, uh, you know, these information symmetries? You know, which are really at the heart of a lot of the unwarranted demand and the over-servicing uh, that we, that is well evidenced uh, in, in, the, um, in the system. You know, we know that the chances of having a knee replaced can vary four to five times depending upon where you live in the country. You know, not based upon any clinical factors, but purely where, where you live. It's a, you know, it's a story of supply induction. Um, 
So information asymmetry is uh, 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 you know, very important to think about how we tackle uh, the, the challenge. Like I can walk into Harvey Norman and if that the salesman tries to sell me a brand new TV, I know if I know a brand new TV, but you know, if my cardiologist says, Mark, you need three stents in your heart tomorrow, and by the way, they should be drug eluding, uh, you know, what I do, I say, well, what time, doc? So, you know, a big, big question about how do we tackle those information asymmetries? And the other big question is what do we do about moral hazard implicit in the system? Because moral hazard, once upon a time, wasn't such a huge issue because you pretty much only ended up the doctors or in hospitals if you've been hit by a bus or you had cancer or whatever the case may be. Now, today, we well know people choose to have uh, health care. And there's, there's the big grey area of discretion, which is just an invitation uh, uh, to moral hazard. And of course, typically, there aren't any price signals because of you know, our social insurance system um, we call Medicare. And by the way, I think the $7 co-payment, even though I publicly waved the flag, I thought it was a dumb, very dumb policy, uh, you know, very dumb politics. You know, the real, <laughs> you know, the idea that, that I pay the same co-pay as you know, Betty on a pension living out the back blocks of Blacktown, it's just silly politics. You know, much better politics would have been to say, well, Mark, you're not getting any Medicare subsidy anymore, and we're going to double uh, you know, Betty's um, uh, entitlement. But I'm sure we'll come, that will come up in, uh, in, in discussion. So moral hazard is a real issue we need to think about tackling, and there's a, there are a raft of issues uh, to be thought about there, including health savings accounts, because you know, health savings account gives, gives us an opportunity to create a price signal without any detriment to the to the consumer without any risk that people might go without care that is actually, uh, would actually be worthwhile uh, for their health and uh, well-being. The other, the other, and I'll come back to, both those issues are at the heart of um, this other mismatch I've thought about for many years now is when you think about, well look, what do you do about managing uh, demand in this system? And what the systems, not only in Australia worldwide, are typically sought to do is manage it on the supply side. So they've rationed supply, you know, which is the essence of the national health system in the UK, and even Medicare for that matter. That's been a, a, a control. Um, you know, they've sought to make the system more efficient through the application of technology. But as we know, technology, particularly in healthcare, has this unfortunate tendency to actually drive costs with robotic, robotic surgery uh, and, and, and so forth. They've sought to redefine what, what, what is actually reasonable to be, be funded. Uh, no better example of that has, uh, than the um, current review of the MBS schedule, which is important. You know, it's, it's important that we, you know, we wipe out 5,000 uh, services if they, if they have no uh, clinical efficacy uh, anymore. It's been about, well, OK, well, let's make sure we only pay for what has clinical efficacy and then make sure we don't pay any more than we have to. So it's been about cost, you know, driving down the cost of uh, Calvary hospitals or doctor's fees or whatever the case may, uh, may be. Or it's been about trying to redesign the system to produce a more integrated experience for people with chronic illness or whatever the case may be. But when you think about it, they're all supply side driven solutions. And you can't manage a market. A market won't find equilibrium if you're just working on the supply side. There's been far too little attention <coughs> applied to the demand side of, um, of, of the healthcare economy uh, and, and equation. And that it means starting to think about, well, you know, how do we tackle some of the sources of market failure, the information symmetries and moral ha hazard on, on the demand side? How can we make basically, because we're, you know, all, all industry revolutions are pretty much led by consumers in the end. Just think about what's happening in the digital age. You know, it's consumers. And what's happening in the digital age is fundamentally we're seeing a shift of power from suppliers to, to consumers. So consumers are now being able to exert their preferences through Airbnb, you know, through uh, Uber, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we go about, if we're really going to tackle the problems which we think dog the system and which bear the risk of allocative and technical inefficiency or, or, or elevate the risk, how do we go about doing that? How do we make consumers, first of all, um, behave uh, in a way which improves health outcomes? 
Um, you know, when you think about 40 years ago when people were happily sucking on cigarettes at a rate of 30 in every 100 in the population, what was going on there? Was it just ignorance? Was it, the, was, it, was it actually information asymmetries at a behavioural level? Like tobacco companies at some point knew exactly what was at stake here, but consumers uh, didn't. And so how do we start to tackle some of those information asymmetries which lead to, to, to poor behaviour? And I think technology will, will go a long way to solving that. You know, it's not too far away before we have little nano capsules circulating in our blood screens, alerting us to any problems or even shooting out <coughs> mutant um, you know, cancer genes. It, it actually will happen. You know, it's not too far away where I'll be able to look at my watch at any given time know exactly about my blood sugar levels, you know, way beyond the typical diagnosis we're familiar with, in a way which helps me manage my behaviour. Mark, do not eat that, Kate. Your body's had enough sugar today. It's going to be detriment to your health. And we will improve, particularly with the health of um, technology and our health behaviour. So those, those information asymmetries around our, our behaviour, I'd like to think will gradually be taken uh, uh, care of. Uh, then it's a question of, well, look, when it does come to uh, the need for treatment, so I am sick, uh, I have got a crook knee or a crook uh, hip, you know, what is my best treatment alternative? Is it a knee replacement or is it weight loss um, with 12 months of physio? Uh, and if it is weight loss or 12 months of physio or a knee replacement, who do I actually see? You know, who is the best doctor? Who is the best physio? Who is the best weight loss coach? So somehow we need to put consumers in a position where, where um, A, they're behaving better, B, when the time comes for treatment, they have much greater understanding and knowledge of, of the best treatment option for them. Like, you know, frankly, most people are clueless. If you know, just go with what the doctor uh, says. And three, that they can actually choose the doctor, the hospital, the dentist, based upon some measurable <coughs> to your point, Rowan, uh, 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 criteria. You know, it's a TripAdvisor. You know, how do we bring TripAdvisor to healthcare? Um, so, you know, th that's an interesting challenge around how do we talk about you know, the information symmetries? And look, it is doable, and I don't want to make turn this into a commercial, but we launched, for example, uh, 18 months ago, a TripAdvisor site, site called Whitecoat. Now, you can go on Whitecoat now, and uh, find a, a, a dentist or a physio, even a GP now, soon to be specialists in hospitals, find out pa what other patients have said about the experience, see a satisfaction rating, uh, use the site to get into more, get into their portal or their uh, site to find out more about their practice and their thinking. And gradually we're building content on it to help you make better decisions around behaviour and your choices around treatment. So, you know, it's not as hard as it sounds, this idea of making consumers uh, more informed and hopefully better uh, consumers of uh, uh, healthcare. Um, on the moral hazard side, um, as Jeremy touched upon, I, I too believe somehow we need to create price signals to uh, overcome um, an, an element of uh, a moral hazard. We need to be careful about that, just as Ron mentioned with the GST, that we don't disadvantage those uh, least equipped financially uh, to do with that. But you know, there's ways and means of doing that. I think they're separate arguments. Um, um, other, other forms of moral hazard. Um, um, I had one on the top of my mind there. I've lost it. But yeah, I don't know if Singapore is exactly the price. Singapore is a different place. You know, it's a, it's a nation almost within what everywhere everyone's in reach of uh, you know, hospitals and doctors within 50 uh, kilometres. But there, there's certainly a place for that. Um, I think they're about the only thoughts I wanted. I, short uh, share. I, sorry, I haven't gone for 20 minutes, but I was figuring in any case an hour uh, all that might be a bit, um, a bit tough and I look forward to Q&A this time. Cheers.